I'm so happy to to get to be here together this evening and yeah, really appreciate you all for taking the time, showing up, um, pausing to kind of reflect on some of these topics tonight. And um, I'll also be sending out the recording so you can watch this again, um, check out the PowerPoint slides again, share it with folks whom you think might benefit. And we will have time at the end for questions and comments. And I'm excited to hear from all of you. So I'm gonna get started and I'm gonna share my screen. And if you need to kind of make your Zoom icons smaller so you can actually see the slides, you can just kind of do that at the top of your little Zoom icons. You'll see a lot of little boxes that you can click um, to try to make things smaller. And let's see if PowerPoint wants to cooperate with us. Um, so I really wanted to talk about this idea of promoting longevity, right? We are, as a species, living longer as the generations go on. And what I see a lot, not only in my practice, but also in my family, is that different folks have different levels of quality of life as they age. and there's this thought about, you know, really what's the point of living to an older age if I'm not experiencing high quality of life, right? And there are things we can do if we're 40, if we're 50, if we're 80 to continue to enhance that quality of life. And that's really what I wanted to talk about tonight. Um, so I'll start by way of welcome to say that we are just one week past the spring equinox, which was last Monday, March 20th. And often for me, when this moment of equal day and equal night comes along, there's a feeling that things that are out of balance are actually highlighted in my life. And I kind of notice, wow, it's a moment of balance in nature. And what it's bringing up for me is what's out of balance. And I think that's that's normal. And if you've been noticing that too, if you've been noticing anxiety, impatience, obstructions, like the seed trying to come up through the frozen soil, I think that's normal. And I'm a student of Chinese cosmology, among many other things. And we find ourselves right now in a wood rabbit year. The Chinese cosmological system is a system of stems and branches. And so within that, there are five elements, the stems, and then there are 12 branches, which are represented by 12 creatures, 12 animals. So we're in the water rabbit year. Water represents winter, wisdom, old age, and rabbit represents um, yin wood. So yin, is this quality um, in Chinese philosophy, Asian philosophy that, that represents receptivity, taking things in. And we came out of a yang year last year, which was expansive and probably many of us felt that. And now we're in a yin year, which is about being receptive. And the rabbit likes to be in its burrow be with its community, relate through community, and then poke its head out every once in a while, see what's going on, gather some information, and then go back in. So if your big plans feel like they're not manifesting or coming to fruition, that's actually okay. Keep dreaming, scheming, weaving your plans and visions, and and know that there'll be more momentum next year in the dragon year, which is a young, expansive year, um, for things to really take shape and unfold. 
And we also find ourselves in a particular lunation where at the first quarter of the moon right now, the new moon was the spring equinox, that's a rabbit lunation. So it's rabbit on rabbit. And rabbit is saying, go into the burrow. There's still time to rest, believe it or not, even though the feeling of spring is very quickly arising in the trees, in the plants, in our own systems, there's actually still time to dream and rest and notice the way things are um, and just notice what's coming up in us. So as always, I, I light a candle for our time together um, and I give thanks to my ancestors um, who are some of my greatest teachers to all of the teachers that I've had in this lifetime, not only human teachers, but also teachers in the form of illness, in the form of nature. Um, and I am excited to dive in. So here's some ideas for promoting longevity. Um, and I'm calling them bright ideas because it's my fun acronym to help you sort of remember some of these tools. Um, so we're going to go over these things. Breathing, looking at our habits and our emotional responses, um, thinking about bringing more green food into our lives just because it's so detoxifying. It's so supportive to the gut microbiome, which, as we'll find out, can contribute to longevity and greater quality of life. Um, getting outside always is so important for not only keeping muscles and joints healthy, but keeping the brain healthy, the cardiovascular system healthy, and reducing inflammation, right? Unless we're running more than 13 miles a day every day, um, movement is not necessarily a weight loss strategy, but it is a strategy for reducing inflammation, right? When we don't move, the body expends more energy dealing with inflammation. When we do move, the body is able to more easily reduce inflammation and it can expend energy doing the movement that we're doing. Um, so always getting outside, moving our bodies can be so helpful. And healing the liver. I think liver is a really important organ to think about in this day and age because of the nature of our complex reality. We often have liver congestion culturally. And that's both physical and emotional. And liver is also in Chinese medicine, the organ of spring. And after a long winter, the spring brings rejuvenation and the liver asks for that rejuvenation. And when it doesn't get it, it can get cranky or downright angry. So supporting the liver is always important and especially in the spring. And then tending to our digestion, right? So as I was saying, a strong microbiome that is in alignment with your enteric type, your original gut type, is going to promote longevity. And guess what? You can get expensive testing to find out what your gut type is. And if you know a little bit about your ancestry and which foods from your ancestral lands really resonate with you the most, then you're probably eating in accordance with your gut type. And that's only going to promote reduced inflammation, reduced stress, and therefore longevity. So idea number one, it's all about breathing. And I want to talk about breathing within the context of um, this response that we all have access to called CRTA conserved transcriptional response to adversity. So this, you know, is a big scientific term, right? And it comes out of um, a myriad of scientific studies, but essentially what it's trying to say is that our innate immune system, our first line of defense against pathogens, which develops in utero and is kind of the first immune system that babies have, before they develop their adaptive immune system, right? Because they're adapting to all of the viruses and bacteria in their environment. This innate immune system, which resides in the gut, by the way, in gut bacteria, 
has the capacity to protect us from a threat, right? We're being chased. And the essentially response to digestion, response to um, all different kinds of natural metabolic processes shuts down so that we can make sure the body is able to deal with immediate inflammation, right? From the stress of running away from a predator and potentially even injuring ourselves in that process. And that, you know, immediate acute inflammation is actually beneficial. And those um, hormones that are released, right? Endorphins can be beneficial, but what happens is that we found through a lot of scientific research that this CRTA, this response to adversity can actually also be activated by kind of ambient stress, right? Social stress, um, threats that we perceive because our nervous system is dysregulated. And this activation is, you know, not totally natural, right? And puts us in this space of chronic stress that leads to chronic inflammation. So here's a diagram again from that particular study about the CRTA that shows how, you know, all of these different pieces, right? Our genetics, our personality, or I would even call that our inherent constitution, and then the conditions of our environment can lead to this cycle of having that mild inflammation when we perceive a threat, whether real or not, that leading to anxiety, and then our mind seeing the world in this way that kind of can produce more anxiety. And that actually leads to inflammation because the body thinks I need to generate inflammation to um, help this person not be stressed, right? So ultimately, reducing inflammation is so much about reducing stress and helping our bodies to regulate and know it's okay. Yes, this might be a stressful situation emotionally, and we're still safe. That can be so, so crucial and foundational to reducing inflammation, right? Because of the stress inflammation cycle. That's how the body likes to deal with stress is by creating inflammation to say, hey, we've got a problem here. And that's not actually not helpful always. So a couple different breaths that I really like. And I think great if you wanna try these to add them into something you're already doing, like eating a meal. It could also be something like brushing your teeth. It could also be something like going to bed. And studies do show that accepting ourselves, having compassion for how we are right now, these kinds of frameworks are key to breaking that cycle of inflammation and stress. So the self-compassion breath is to breathe in and think, I am, breathe out at peace. And then the acceptance breath is to just take a breath in, take a breath out and just think, this is how it is right now. It doesn't mean I might not want things to change, totally fine, and it's okay. This is how it is right now. I wanted to, because I'm a big fan of essential oils, just plug some different essential oils that can be wonderful to have around and combine with breath. Um, tangerine, basil, myrtle, and lavender, any one or all of those can be uplifting, can be energizing, and essential oils like rosemary and eucalyptus can actually be supportive to the immune system um, and to reducing viral and bacterial load in your environment, wherever you are. And I think you can kind of have little bottles of these around and sniff them if you want to. You can diffuse them through a diffuser sprinkle them 
on your rug and vacuum them up. All good ways to take them in. So that was a little um, food for thought about breathing. And this is the idea number two, thinking about old patterns. Um, and for spring, I like to think about these questions. Where do I see obstacles in my life? What do I perceive as an obstacle, whether or not it actually is? And then when do I feel impatient? What's, what's causing me impatience, right? Because obstacles and impatience can be triggers for anxiety and depression, which I think are two sides of the same coin, ultimately. And I'm not trying to say we need to re remove our obstacles or fix our impatience. I think really the step is awareness and noticing these things and, and noticing how we relate to them, right? How our emotions kind of get, get charged and reactive around something that feels like an obstacle or something that we feel impatient about. And, and just noticing how that leads to us creating our own stress. Easier said than done, we all do it, myself included. And, and awareness is, is so helpful to things unfolding and changing. Um, and I love the idea of starting a five minute journaling practice. Maybe it's in the morning, maybe it's in the evening, but just brain dump, write down some of these things about obstacles, about impatience and what you notice. That's all. Um, some other writing prompts, if you really want to get deeper into this, um, is to write about where am I right now? Where will I be in three months? When it'll be summer, right? What will that feel like? And what'll be different? Obviously, a lot will be different in our environment. And if we think about the seasons from the Chinese element perspective, you know, water is winter and kind of this time of, of things dissolving and simplifying in a way. And then spring is this moment of things waking up of all of this potential that can be exciting or it can be anxiety provoking even. And then summer is kind of when we take that potential and put it into action, right? So I love these journaling prompts especially for this time of year, for the springtime, because there's so much happening. There's, there's so much shifting, right? This is, this is kind of a transitional season. We're going out of water in winter and we're into wood now, right? Like the maple sap rising in the trees. And then we're heading to fire, which is summer and actualization. Um, so Things, things to reflect on if you feel inspired to do five minutes of writing on a daily basis. And I think releasing old patterns is really helpful because they do get stuck emotionally. And that emotional stuckness, a lot of traditional healing modalities believes, leads to liver stagnation, right? So this liver stagnation can then become a block to the innate immune system that's in the gut functioning properly because liver stores our bile and we need our bile to digest and break down food in our stomach. So really important to think about not only our physical health, but also our emotional health and how those are connected and what are, what are some patterns and some ways that just aren't helpful anymore. They're, they don't fit. They don't make sense anymore. Often there's something that's right in front of us that we can wake up and notice in the spring that's not helpful and is ready to move on. So as I was saying in Chinese medicine, we think of this moment as water moving into wood, right? So just as much as in the cold, we can slow down. We can have these more inward moments. As the water moves upward into the trees and the plants and things kind of wake up, so to speak, there can be a heightened sense of anxiety, right? And for some people that shows up as depression. And I think that's, it's important to just notice that and pay attention to it and, 
Maybe that's not coming up for you. Great. If not, and if it is, it's it's okay. You're actually in alignment with spring, right? In Ayurveda, um, traditional healing modality from India, we think about spring as kapha time, and kapha means earth. So earth is waking up, and it can get a little easier to get stuck in the mud, right? So that's kind of that depression side of things. Um, good to be noticing these patterns. Idea number three, increase your greens. I think green foods, bitter green foods are so helpful to reduce indigestion, to support the liver and any liver congestion, um, to help the gallbladder that is the actual storage place of our bile. So the liver kind of recycles and cleans our bile after our stomach uses it, stores it in the gallbladder, and then we start to eat food. The liver says, here you go, stomach. I'm gonna get the bile from the gallbladder and send it over. And then we start to break things down. Um, so we really want those bile ducts from the gallbladder to the liver, to the stomach, to be free flowing and not sludgy. And they can get sludgy really easily. Um, so think about promoting bile flow. Add lemon to your water. Cook with spices like cardamom, cumin and coriander, ginger. Make fennel tea or chew on fennel seeds before you eat. Um, and again, all of the leafy greens, it's time. If you haven't been feeling drawn to them as much, you know, they don't have to be raw necessarily. If that feels too cold to you, they can be cooked. But bring in those greens. They feed your gut microbiome and they help your body do its own natural work of detoxifying. Um, so I love this drink in the spring. Um, it's really kind of more of a soup. Um, you can drink it at room temperature and you can drink it warm as well. So I like to just have broth and blend celery, zucchini, spinach, kale in there. You could even throw in some of those spices like cumin and coriander or ginger or all three. Um, let them simmer, blend them and have kind of like a green, a warm, soothing green smoothie alongside your meal, you know, with rice and beans or animal proteins. Um, it's a great thing to make and freeze as well and have around when you're feeling cranky or sluggish or even nauseous um, or just heavy or even anxious. I really like this recipe. Idea number four, get outside. As I was already talking about, Breath is really our first source of nourishment. And I find when we move, we really start to notice our breath more. And of course we can do this inside as well. And I think there's something special about being outside, being at air temperature and having our bodies kind of naturally adapt to the change in seasons. Um, and I encourage you to just bring awareness to your breath as you're moving, whether you're inside or outside. Maybe there's a moment when you realize, oh, I'm, I'm breathing. And how can you just take a moment to make your breath deeper? Or how can you even do that before you start moving? You know, tie your shoes, put on your coat. <sighs> just take a breath, detoxify before you even get moving really helps us to attune to what's happening in the moment. And many of you already know this, there are tons of studies out there about time and nature and longevity. Um, and the Harvard School of Epidemiology has done an incredible body of work on this and seen that, of course, when people are outside in nature with plants and trees breathing with them, of course, the reduced air pollution helps with lung health, helps with cardiovascular health. And it also became really apparent in these studies that the mental health piece 
of moving and being outside is tremendous in terms of people's health outcomes, in terms of their quality of life later into life. So the more you can be in green spaces and move your body, gentle walks, it doesn't have to be cardiovascular, you know, heart pounding necessarily, the more we promote longevity. So I love that one. Um, and I do think it <coughs> moving, breathing, being conscious about the food that we're putting into our bodies, being conscious about anxiety and depression and when these emotions show up in our day, um, in our year, right? In the cycle of seasons, it's just this opportunity to, to pause and to witness transformation and, and to think of our body as a friend, as our teammate, not something we have to fix, not something that's, that's frustrating or not working. Of course, it's absolutely fine to feel like there are parts of me that I would like to have be different. Uh, obviously, that's, that's part of how our minds work. That's part of the nature of reality is change. And we want to be working with our body. We want to be listening to our body. We want to be witnessing how our body is showing up right now, because that's truly all the information we need for healing and for cultivating wellness. And, you know, folks like me in the health sphere may have knowledge and training and tools. And ultimately, it is about befriending ourselves and witnessing ourselves. That's where the information is about health and longevity. So idea number five, heal your liver. We really talked about this already because liver is the organ of spring in Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, the Mediterranean um, healing modality that I grew up with in Italy. So many different traditional philosophies see the importance of supporting the liver all year round and especially in the spring. So think about eating green foods. If you like artichokes and leeks, they're amazingly rich in prebiotic fiber that feeds your beneficial gut bacteria, which secretes hormones that promote longevity and that can turn off DNA switches um, that might cause inflammation. And that's also your gut bacteria, the seat of the innate immune system, that first line of defense. That's a make it or break it in terms of whether or not our stress leads to chronic inflammation, right? So those prebiotic fibers, so helpful. Burdock and dandelion root, really gently helping the liver to do its own detoxification work. And those also contain inulin, which is a prebiotic fiber. So great for feeding beneficial gut bacteria. And then breathing, right? Breathing with compassion. I am at peace. This is the way it is right now. And just letting your liver know it's okay. It's okay if you're cranky. I'm doing what I can to support you and help you move into summer and actualization. And I really can't say enough about drinking water that you feel good about and that is high quality. And the liver does love itself a little sour flavor. So it can feel really good to squeeze lemon into your water. Um, it can be first thing in the morning. It can be before a meal. It really primes the stomach receptor cells to be hydrated before you eat, which is what they need, and to give them a little bit more acidity so that they can work in concert in partnership with bile to break down your food as it goes into your stomach from your mouth. Um, water and especially lemon water is also a really great lymph detoxifier, right? And it's like if the sap that's rising up in the trees is their lymph, our lymphatic fluids that are helping our bodies to detoxify are also kind of rising up and asking for renewal and refreshment right now. And, and lemon is a great 
kind of global way to address all of that, liver, lymph, bile, digestion. So our last idea, number six, tending to digestion. And of course I would talk about digestion and I'm talking about it tonight in the frame of longevity because I think it's so important to understand that we are bacteria. I am comprised of way more bacteria than I am Lisa, my own identity, personality, right? And that bacteria is responsible for an incredible amount of processes. And there are a lot of studies out there right now that are purely on animals, primarily mice, about um, taking a microbiome of, um, you know, a mouse that lived a really healthy, long life and putting it into a sick mouse and, and seeing how much change takes place there, right? And scientists, of course, are now trying to figure out exactly which strains of bacteria promote longevity and, and how to encapsulate those and get those out into the public sphere, right? I think that's certainly worthwhile. And as I said at the beginning of this talk, understanding more about our ancestry and understanding more about the foods that are indigenous to those lands of our ancestors, trying those foods, feeling what it feels like in our bodies to eat them, and then really embracing the ones that feel resonant to us, that is ultimately cultivating our own microbiome's capacity to support longevity. Um, so above and beyond any trend that might be out there around food, I think knowing more about ourselves, our bodies, what they're primed to digest because of our heritage um, and what resonates with our bodies because of our unique kind of ex life experience and everything that's brought us to this moment right now, that is foundational to, to promoting longevity, to helping our body to effectively produce energy, to supporting mitochondria, right? As they make ATP, adenosine triphosphate, AKA energy. So supporting stronger muscles, supporting firmer skin, supporting, you know, more kind of elasticity of tissues, flexibility of bones and joints and ligaments, all of these different pieces. And of course, supporting brain health, supporting cognitive health, right? Because we have this nerve called the vagus nerve, the first cranial nerve that originates in the gut and travels all the way up the body, touching each one of our organs on the way, checking in, saying, how's it going? And then going to the brain and saying, hey, we're doing great. Or I don't know, things aren't so good. Um, and that um, message of, wow, things aren't so good can cause a lot of confusion, which is ultimately this sort of catch-all term that we refer to as brain fog sometimes in the health space. And there's so much we can do to support our nervous system with breath, reduce inflammation by moving and supporting our gut microbiome um, that will promote longevity. But ultimately my message is your body is on your side. You're on the same team. Um, and your body can absolutely help you reduce inflammation, help you to heal, help you to have high quality of life into older years. And it's about, it's about listening and about knowing that, that you're on the same team, the mind and body. Um, so if this information is feeling interesting, inspiring, I'd love to have you as part of our monthly membership community. It's called the Vibrant Health Academy. It's $19 a month. I'm offering 20% off right now. And I'll, I'll share that discount with you all when I send out the recording. And we have an amazing group. We have new moon classes with guest teachers. We have full moon classes where I'm offering information like what you're hearing tonight. 
um, I created an online library where I've dumped every piece of information that I have about health and wellness. It's a great repository um, and treasure trove of info. And then I also post recipes on our member site. So if this sounds interesting, if it sounds supportive, if you're feeling like, yes, it's the rabbit year, I wanna be in community with everybody else in our borough, learning together, reflecting, um, please join us. And I wanna, I wanna offer gratitude again to all of you for being here, for showing up, for caring about these topics, for taking the time. Um, and keep these bright ideas in mind if they feel helpful. The breathing, looking at our habits and patterns and emotional responses, increasing greens and getting moving, supporting the liver and, and tending to our gut microbiome. These are all wonderful strategies for longevity um, and reduced inflammation. So I want to take a moment to hear people's questions. This is an opportunity to, to jump in. Let me know if there's something that sparked your interest, something you wanna hear more about, something you were curious about. Feel free to unmute yourself and jump in. Uh, hi, Lisa. Hi. This is Rick uh, hi. from Massachusetts with Laura. Um, I had a question about um, uh, about the artichokes are you when you speak of using artichokes and soups are you talking about jerusalem artichoke or no. globe artichoke globe artichoke good question jerusalem artichoke is a very different creature although it does contain some of the same prebiotic fibers that i was talking about um a lot of folks actually have a hard time digesting jerusalem artichokes they're beloved among the permaculture community because they're perennial, um, they're fairly easy to dig, and I find they require a lot of boiling and sauteing prior to being digestible. So no, I am actually looking at the globe artichoke, Chinara um, officinalis, which at this time of year, I tend to get artichoke hearts in a glass jar, um, and I like to rinse them and drain them and and throw them into a soup you know it can be a pureed green soup kind of like that green drink that i was suggesting mm -hmm. i also really like making a spread out of them and this is kind of what i grew up doing so just artichoke hearts olive oil lemon salt great for the liver great for the microbiome put it on your cooked meat or beans put it on your rice um put it on crackers it's a really delicious way to take in artichokes and, mm -hmm. and feed your gut microbiome. Um, and if you're finding like, wow, these artichokes are causing a lot of gas and bloating, that's okay. That's a sign that they're doing their work of feeding your gut bacteria. And maybe it just means having a little bit less because that's all that you need. And that's a great question. So I appreciate you asking. Okay, well, thank you. My pleasure. Anyone else? Please jump in. Well, I don't have a question, but I certainly do appreciate your having these reminders that, that bring us together periodically. I don't know if I'm ready to make the actual jump 
life is so busy sometimes. But I'm just so glad that this continue. It's like you're the year. The thing you can like you're like the new moon or something. Like you can count on something coming around again. So that's really, really been precious. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Um, yeah. Thank you for showing up and being part of the community. I appreciate it. And I think, you know, despite studying these topics for over 20 years now, I find that this is just as good of a reminder for myself um, to, to take the time to really slow down and notice, right? And kind of do what I can to shut out the noise from the outside, especially because I'm learning and researching and taking in a lot of information in the health sphere. Sometimes it's hard for me too. And that's all very interesting and is food for thought. And I try to really balance that with listening to my body, listening to, to what it's asking for. Um, and Hopefully some of the suggestions that I've made tonight kind of align with what your body might be asking of you. And if you don't know and you're curious, I think starting with some breathing and just paying attention will bring some of that information to the surface, right? And you may even start to notice what I call kind of instructive cravings, right? I think we we have destructive cravings and instructive cravings. And I think the destructive ones are often stress-based and many of those hormones are secreted by our gut. And then they want to be fed more of what kind of keeps that stress cycle going. Um, and then, you know, there are also cravings that are instructive and that are saying, oh, I'm craving artichokes or I'm craving cinnamon, right? And all of these can be really interesting pieces of information about what our bodies are needing to, to restore balance and to maintain balance. Um, and if people don't know the book, The New Whole Foods Encyclopedia, it's a great one that talks about many, many foods not animal foods, um, all plant foods, but kind of, you know, their origins and how to buy them, how to prepare them, and also how they help the body to restore balance. So it's like when I wake up and I'm craving a food that doesn't sound like ice cream or chocolate or chips, right, then I kind of go to that and I read and I reflect on why I might be craving that particular food. Yeah, so I appreciate having these conversations and explorations as well. So I'm grateful to get to do it together. Anything else that people want to share or ask or bring up? And there doesn't have to be anything right now. Um, I'm here, I'm around. You can always send me a note, ask me a question. Let me know what's on your mind. Um, yeah, and you're very much welcome to come and join the Academy, check it out. Um, and also feel free to peruse my website. I have lots of resources there lots of recipes. Um, it's a fun place to explore. And I'm always adding new content. So thank you all for being here. Thank you, Lisa. It's my thank pleasure. You. Nice to see you. Happy spring. Happy spring to you too. Yeah. And please stay in touch, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye.